Hello friends, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Michael Nicodemus and this is my YouTube channel. If this is the first time that you have visited my channel, I thank you for that. And for my return uh, visitors, uh, welcome back. What I'm going to be talking about in this video is uh, additional questions that have came about from the near-death event uh, video that I shot. You can see that right here. My friends, I'm going to get started with that uh, Q&A right after I pay tribute to my Lord and Savior. If you join me in doing so, I'll be right back. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Well, my friends, a lot of people have asked me additional questions since I uh, shot this video uh, that you can see right here. Uh, there's a card that uh, shows up on the YouTube uh, um, channel, but it doesn't show up on the Facebook when I share it there. So I'm sharing the picture of that uh, video that I shot. And I also put that uh, description link in the descriptions below. So you can go to that uh, video and watch that in any time. So I did see God, and I seen God through a near-death event. A lot of people have asked me, how do I know that it was God that I seen? Well, my friends, I cried out to God a couple weeks before this accident and asked Him to reveal Himself to me in a real way. And He did uh, through this near-death event. Okay, so when I, mean, I had this near-death event, that presence appeared at the end of my bed, and I had an outer-body experience. and. Uh, I actually flatlined and uh, had this near-death event experience six times in one evening. And I don't want to really go into the details of that video. I want to get into the questions that were asked about uh, for people that actually asked me to answer some additional questions. So I'm going to be sharing a little site on the screen up here that has this question on it, but I'm going to read most of my answers and the ones that I know off the off back of my mind, I won't put that on the screen and I won't have to read it, but uh, the ones that uh, do need a, a Bible answer, I'm going to read the answer. The reason that I'm going to read my answer, my friends, is because I believe that it's necessary for me to get all the information out, and if I don't read it, I might uh, misinterpret some of what it's saying. So let's look at the, net, the first question here, my friends. Uh, did you feel at home? My friends, I got to the gates of heaven and I realized that uh, it was God that was with me. And I, when I realized where I was going, I pleaded for a second chance to return to earth to help people. I seen something that most people won't see until they die. I had a second chance to come back to, back to help people. But the question is, is, did you feel at home? I felt a calmness and I felt at peace, but I also felt an urgency because the presence that was in my room was also my wife at that time trying to bring me back, doing CPR on me, bring me back, but the presence of God was just as strong. So hopefully I answered that question. Uh, did I feel at home? I felt uh, very much at peace and very much uh, comfort that I was getting from God himself. Next question, my friends. Is it... Is there truly nothing to fear for certain? Is there truly nothing to fear for certain? I believe that that question is asked about death, about the afterlife. Is there nothing to fear? Absolutely. If you're walking with Jesus, if you have that personal relationship with him, and if you have repented from your sins and you have confessed and Jesus is the Lord of your life, there is nothing to fear in death, my friends. Death is a beginning to another life. For certain. I know that without a shadow of a doubt. All right, my friends, uh, question number three. What did you see in heaven? Examples, meadows, flowers, water, cities, examples. Well, my friends, I didn't get into heaven. I stomped at the gates of heaven because I realized where I was going and I realized who I was with. At that time, I decided stop and plead with God for a second chance. So I did not make it into heaven. So I cannot answer that question. Okay, let's move on to the next question here. What exactly does God and Jesus look like? What do we do there forever after this life? Okay, 
So you know that uh, in that uh, first video I shot, I shared a, a slide or an image of the image that I saw, and you can see that right here. My friends, I uh, seen that image, and it was a white robe. It didn't have any face, it didn't have any hands, but it was it was constant white. Um, it wasn't dark like you see in the in that picture right here. My friends, um, we see God in the spirit world. When we die, we leave our body, and it's our spirit that transcends. And our, our spirit is our soul. So our soul belongs to God. Whether you believe in Him or not, our soul belongs to God. And that's going to be raised up out of your body to extend into heaven. All right? So the second part of that question, as you're going to see here, is uh, what do we do there forever after this life? What, we, what do we do there forever after in this in the afterlife? I believe, my friends, uh, that answer could be answered in uh, our church service. We spend time praising God and we spend time adoring God before the message is there. So I think that uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, praising God. I think we're going to be singing and we're going to be uh, full of joy and full of love and full of peace, my friends, because there is no sorrow when you get to heaven just isn't doesn't happen there's no sorrow in heaven how can there be sorrow when we're in constant light okay we're going to talk about that light here in a little bit let's look at the next question do you did you hear music and what did it sound similar to here on earth let me read that again did you hear music and what did it sound similar to here on earth well, friends, I didn't hear any music. I didn't make it into heaven, as I said. I, I seen the uh, gates of heaven open up and, and uh, didn't really hear anything. It was more like what I observed in the spiritual realm. And the next question, my friends, is do you think there is purgatory? That's a big question to ask me, my friends, because I have to speculate from the faith that I know from a belief that I have, and I'm gonna read my answer to you, my friends. So I'm gonna go back to my my laptop screen that I'm reading from. I'm not gonna put this on the screen in front of me, my friends. I'm just gonna read um, what I wrote down here. And this is full of scriptures, my friends, and uh, you can uh, refer to these scriptures. I'm going to tell you the scripture, but I'm actually going to talk about briefly what the scriptures say, okay? So uh, again, do you think that there is purgatory? My friends, purgatory is a place between heaven and hell where wayward souls go to get it right. Honestly, I believe if, we're, if there is any kind of purgatory, my friends, I believe that it's here on earth right now where there are wayward souls waiting here in the flesh form to try to figure out how to get it right. If there is a purgatory, it's still here on earth. But when we die, this is what's going to happen. The answer to that question, do I think there is purgatory? According to the Catholic uh, Encyclopedia, purgatory is a place of condition or temporal punishment for those who departed this life in God's grace are not entirely free from virtual or venial faults or have not fully paid the satisfaction due to their transgressions. To summarize in Catholic theology, purgatory is a place that a Christian soul that Christian souls goes to after death to be cleansed of the sins that have not been fully satisfied during life. Is this doctrine of purgatory in agreement with the Bible? It says absolutely not, my friends. Why does it say that it's not it does not line up with the Bible? Let's look at this uh, idea of purgatory. Jesus died to pay the penalty for all of our sins, and we see that in Romans 5, verse 8. And in Isaiah 53, 5 declares, But he was purest for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus suffered for our sins so that we could be delivered from suffering. To say that we must also suffer for our sins is to say that Jesus' suffering was insignificant. 
To say that we must atone for our sins by cleansing in purgatory is to deny the sufficiency of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, and we see that in 1 John 2, verse 2. The idea that we have to suffer for our sins after death is contrary to everything the Bible says about salvation. All right? And this article goes on to read the primary scriptural passage Catholics point to for evidence in purgatory is 1 Corinthians uh, 3, verse 15, which says, If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. The passage, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, is using an illustration of things going through fire as a description of believers' working works being judged. If our works are of good quality, good silver, costly stone, they will pass through the fire unharmed and will and we will be rewarded for them. If our works are of poor quality, wood, hay, and straw, they will be consumed by the fire and there will be no reward. The passage does not say that believers pass through the fire, but rather that the believers' works pass through the fire. Okay? And again in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 15 refers to the believers escaping through the flames, not being cleansed by the, the flames. Purgatory, like many other Catholic dogmas, is based on a misunderstanding of the nature of Christ's sacrifice. Catholics view the Mass in a... Uh, I don't know how to say this word, so I'm going to spell it. E-U-C-H... A R I S T. Okay, I don't even want to try to pronounce it. As a representation of Christ's sacrifice, because they fail to understand that Jesus once for all sacrifice was absolutely and perfectly sufficient in Hebrews 7 uh, 23. Catholics uh, view uh, meritismness works as contributing to salvation due to failure to recognize that Jesus' sacrificially, sacrificial payment has no need of additional contribution. And we, we see that in Ephesians 2, 8-9. through 9. Similarly, purgatory is understood by Catholics as a place of cleansing and preparation for heaven because they did not recognize that because of Jesus' sacrifice we are already cleansed declared righteous, forgiven, redeemed, reconciled, and sanctified. The very idea of purgatory and the doctrines that are often attached to it, pray for the dead, indulgence, merited, um, meritedness, works of on behalf of the dead, etc., fail to realize that Jesus' death was sufficient to pay the penalty of all of our sins. Jesus, who was God incarnated in John 1, 1 and verse 14, paid an infinite price for our sins. Jesus died for our sins in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Jesus is the atonement sacrifice for our sins in 1 John 2, 2. To limit Jesus' sacrifice to atonement for original sin or sins committed before salvation is an attack of a person and work of Jesus Christ. It, if we must, in order to be saved, pay for, atone for, or suffer because of our sins, then Jesus' Jesus's death was not a perfect, complete, and sufficient sacrifice. Okay, For believers after death, it, it, it to be... For believers, after death is to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, we see that. And also in uh, Philippians uh, 2, verse 23. Notice that this does not say away from the body in purgatory with the cleansing fire. No, because of the perfection, completeness, and sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice, we are imme immediately in the Lord's presence after death. Fully cleansed, free from sin, glorified, perfected, and ultimately sacrificed. I'm going to read this part again, my friends, because I believe that it has good merit. Okay? It says here, 
No, because in the perfection, completeness, and sufficiency of Jesus' sacrifice, we are immediately in the Lord's presence after death. My near-death event put me into the presence of God, and we say that God is Jesus, right? But I know that it was God and not Jesus. I see them as two different entities, even though that they're both God, okay? Let's look at the next question here. Were we in heaven before we were born here on earth? That's a big one, my friends. I really had to search to find that answer. And if I don't find an answer, if I can't answer that myself, my friends, for what I know or the knowledge that I know, I have to go and I have to research that. So let's see what it says. It says, no, we were created in the moment of conception. However, from God's point of view, God knew we would exist before we did, but we were not in heaven before we were born. Consider these Bible verses. For you, for you formed my inner parts. You knitted me together in my mother's room, womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that comes out of Psalms 139, 13 through 14. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to for adoption of sons through Jesus Christ. And that comes out of Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. I like that part, my friends, because I am an adopted heir of the joint heir of Jesus Christ. Sonship, right? This is a very complex subject and ultimately one that many Christians struggle to understand. It can be understood sim simply that God is outside of time and we are not. We have finitive minds, and God is infinitive. And there's your answer. Next question, my friends. Somebody says, I lost my husband two years ago and grieve deeply every day. I wish to know if he is aware of uh, aware what I am doing here on here and how much I miss him. Also, if we uh, truly if we will truly be together in heaven. And it says some NDER say we reincarnate. I don't want that. I want to be with my soulmate and Jesus, of course. Okay, my friends, if your loved one had a personal relationship with Jesus and you partake, partook in that personal relationship with Jesus with them, then you have confidence to know that that person is in heaven, okay? You know that for sure, okay? Um, it says here, I wish to know if he is aware of what I am doing down here and how much I miss him. I'm going to have to say yes and no. I'm going to have to say no because if what you're doing is experiencing any kind of a pain or any kind of misery or any kind of uh, worry, that loved one isn't going to relate to that. He's not going to know that because that does not exist in heaven. The things that do not exist in the heaven, my friends, are the opposing nature of the fruits of the Spirit. So he's not going to know bitterness. He's not going to know misery. He's not going to know worry. He's not going to know frustrations. And if that's what you're feeling because he's gone, he's not going to know that because he's in heaven at a place of comfort where he feels joy. Okay? So uh, I want to read a uh, answer to... Uh, a misconception about reincarnation. So a lot of people, it says right here, some uh, NDR say we uh, are reincarnated. Okay, so I want to read the answer to that question. The concept of reincarnation is completely without foundation in the Bible, which clearly tells us that we die once and then face judgment in Hebrews uh, 9.27. The Bible never mentions people having a second chance at life or coming back as different people or animals. Jesus told the criminal on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise in Luke 23, verse 43. Not you will have another chance to live a life on this earth, Matthew 25, 46. My friends, there's a difference between death, completely being dead, and a near-death event. There is a big difference in that. A near-death event is going to reveal things that... Uh, a dead person would already be revealed. But if you're coming back from that, if you've got people that are working to restore your uh, earthly body, 
That's not death. That's a near-death event. That's something com completely different than what it's talking about here. I believe that people that have suffered from a near-death near death event, such as I have, bring hope of the evidence of God's existence, therefore the hope and the evidence of Jesus' existence and his life here on earth. Let's go on and read this some more. Okay, it says here, um, We start over. Jesus told the criminal on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise in Luke 23, verse 43. Not, you will have another chance to live a life here on earth in Matthew 25, 46. Specifically tells us that the believers go to an eternal life, which unbelievers go into eternal punishment. Reincarnation has been a popular belief for thousands of years, but it has never been accepted by Christians or followers of Judaism because of its contradiction to scripture. The only passage that some point to as evidence of reincarnation is Matthew 17, 10 through 12, which links John the Baptist with Elijah. However, the passage does not say that John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated, but that he would have fulfilled the prophecy of Elijah's coming into coming to the people having believed his words and therefore believed in Jesus as the Messiah, as we read about in Matthew 17, 12. The people significantly asked John the Baptist if he was Elijah, and he said, No, I am not, in John 1, um, verse 21. Belief in reincarnation is an ancient phenomenon and is a central tenet within the majority of Indian religious traditions such as Hindus, skeptics, and Jainists. I might have I might have said that wrong, but it's J A I N I S M. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. Many uh, modern pagans also believe in reincarnation, as do some New Age movements, along with followers of spiritualism. For the Christian, however, they can there there can be no doubt. Reincarnation is unbiblical and must be rejected as false. Got to keep drinking, my friends. So. A lot of reading and a lot of talking uh, dries out my voice. Got another question here, my friends. How can I find comfort when an unsaved loved one has died? And that's uh, basically the same thing of... Uh, um, we think that we can pray those that have already died that we know did not walk with Jesus. We can pray them into heaven. Okay, this uh, answer goes along with that. Let me read the question again as you're seeing it right here. How can I find comfort when a, an unsaved loved one has died? And the answer is, for the believer, the death of an unsaved loved one is very difficult. Sometimes it seems we will never find comfort or peace of mind when we know the destination awaits the unsaved. When a saved loved one dies, we miss him, but we do not grieve as others who have no hope in 1 Thessalonians uh, um, 4 verse 13, because we know we will be reunited in heaven one day. But for those who die without Christ, we know we will not see them again, and finding comfort in that situation is very difficult, especially for those who have taken great pains to communicate God's truths to their loved ones. There is, a sen there is associated with the sit that situation a pain that asks why, as Christians, we wonder how anyone could refuse such a precious gift. Our joy in the Lord moves us to want that same joy for others. However, the truth is that even though the invitation is open to all, some will not receive the gift. But we can take comfort, encouragement, and assurance in the truth that even though we may never see our loved one again, God is always faithful and just. It is amazing to understand that God is so patient and leaves the door open for so long. Then it goes on to say, my friends, uh, shall not the judge of the earth do right in uh, Genesis eighteen twenty five, And that's a question mark. This is a great comfort to those of us who loved ones have passed into eternity and we are not sure of the destination of their souls. God is a sovereign judge of righteousness, full of grace and mercy for all who 
call upon him, it is, uh, it is his very just that offers a way for all to escape the judgment of his righteousness, and it is in the justice that we must rest. It is the grace that saves us, and it is a grace in which we must stand when we go through the doubt, grief of the death of an unsaved loved one. We must remember that we cannot make this choice for anyone else. And if they want into eternity without Christ, let me read that again. And if they went into eternity without Christ, that was their choice in spite of the offer of grace. Okay. And it goes on to say, although we may have pain in the remembrance of the loved one while once we are in this life and go through the grieving process, there will come a time when uh, each born again believer will be with the Lord. In the day, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither uh, shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away in Revelations 21 verse 4. We cannot comprehend how this will be because we live in, t in time and are constant are constrained to our finite minds. However, just the thought of this is enough to bring comfort and encouragement. When we see the Lord, all of our sorrow we have now will disappear. We now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your love no, and your joy no one will take from you in John 16, verse 22. I want to read that again, my friends, because that's amazing to understand that. When we see the Lord, all of our sorrow we have now will disappear. You now have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take away from you. And that's in John 16, 12. In the meantime, we can lean on the everlasting arms of God, we, who feels our pain and comforts us with His great love and mercy. Wow. And here's another question, my friends. You said that you pleaded for God for a second chance to return to help and to help people. Has God revealed how you are to help people? That's a pretty big question, my friends, as I uh, complete the, the end of this question here. What I like to do, my friends, before I answer that question, uh, there's a scripture that I want to read to you, and actually it's a whole chapter. It's actually 1 Corinthians uh, um, chapter 15. I want to read that to you. But my friends, uh, I'm going to read it to you out of my easy-to-read version of my Bible. And uh, I just had a mark, but uh, I think this is important, my friends, that, that you hear this from the easy-to-read version of the Bible. The easy-to-read version of the Bible is uh, a simple version, my friends, so uh, children can understand it. So I want to read, before I talk about uh, how God has revealed to me to help people, I want to talk to you about this uh, whole chapter. It says here in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the good news about Christ. So if uh, you are a, a near-death returned experienced person, you're going to have some good news about Christ. I have some good news about Christ because I have seen God, or it could have been Jesus, but I refer to him as God because that's what I said. Are you God? God, I love you. I didn't say Jesus. I said God. To me, they're two different people. Okay. Two different presents. Okay, let's uh, start reading this. It's a it's a pretty long read, but I think it's important, my friends. And uh, we are at 27 minutes, so please bear with me. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to remember the good news I told you about. You receive the good news message, and you continue to base your life on it. It is the good news that saves you. But you must continue believing the message that I told, as I told it to you. If you don't, then you believe for nothing. I gave you the message that I received. I told you the most important truth that Christ died for your sins. As the scriptures say that he was buried and was raised to life on the third day. As the scripture says and that he showed himself to Peter and that to the twelve apostles. After that Christ showed himself to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time. 
Most of them are still living today, but some have died. Then he showed himself to James and later to all the apostles. Last of all, he showed himself to me. I was different, like a baby born before the normal time. All of the other apostles are greater than I am. I say this because I persecuted the church of God. That is why I am not even good enough to be called an apostle. But because of God's grace, that I, that is what I am. And His grace that He gave me was not wasted. I worked harder than all the other apostles, but I was not really the one working. It was God's grace that was with me. So then it is not important if I told you God's message or if it was the other apostles who told you. We all tell people the same message, and that is what you believe. And then it goes on in uh, verse 12. It says, we will be raised from death. A near-death event, my friends, is raised from death because we didn't really see death in its fullness. We had a near-death event. And I have uh, neighbors talking next door, so uh, please bear with me. I'll try to put some music underneath this, so uh, hopefully you can hear that instead of them. So uh, we, in verse 12, we tell everyone that Christ was raised from death. So why do some of you say that people will not be raised from death? If, you, uh, if no one will ever be raised from death, then Christ has uh, never been raised. And if Christ has never been raised, then the message we tell you is worth nothing. And your faith is worth nothing. And we will also be guilty of lying about God because we have told you told people about him saying that he raised Christ from the dead. And if no one is raised from death, then God never raised Christ from death. If this was if those who have died are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ is not been raised from death, then your faith is for nothing. You are still guilty of your sins, and though in Christ you have already died are lost, and those in Christ who have already died are lost. If you hope in Christ is only for this life here on earth, then people should feel more sorry for us than for anyone else. But Christ really has been raised from death, the first one of all those who will be raised. Death comes to people because of what one man did. But now, but now there is resurrection from death because of another man. I mean that in Adam all have, in Adam all of us die, and in the same way in Christ all of us will be made alive again. But anyone who will be raised from life in the right order, but everyone will be raised to life in the right order. Christ was first. To be raised, then when Christ comes again, those who belong to him will be raised to life. Then the end will come. Christ will destroy all rulers, authorities, and powers. Then he will give the kingdom to God the Father. Christ must rule until God puts all enemies under his control. That's a pretty good scripture. Christ must rule until God puts enemies under his control. Okay? The last enemy will be destroyed will be death. Wow! The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. As the scripture says, God puts everything under his control. When it says that everything he put under him is clearly that this does not include God himself. God is the one putting everything under Christ's control. After everything has been put under Christ, then the Son himself will be put under God. God is the one who put everything under Christ, and Christ will be put under God so that God will be the complete ruler over everything. If no one will ever be raised from death, then what will the people do who are baptized? For those who are die, have died, if the death are not if the dead are not raised, then why are people baptized for them? <laughs> and what about us who do, why do we put ourselves in danger every hour? I face death every day. That is true, brothers and sisters, just as I 
just as it is true that I am proud of what you are because of Christ Jesus our Lord, I fought with animals in Ephesus. If I did that only for human reasons, then I have gained nothing. If we are not raised from death, let us eat and drink because tomorrow we die. Don't be fooled. Bad friends will ruin good habits. Come back to your right way of thinking and stop sinning. Some of you don't know God. I say this to shame you. Why would he say that we don't know God to shame us? What kind of body will we have? Okay, that's a good question. The Bible clearly answers it. But someone must may ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have? These are stupid questions. When you plant something, it must die in the ground before it can live and grow. And when you plant something, what you plant does not have the same body that will that it will have later. What you plant is only a seed, maybe wheat or something else, but God gives it the body that he has planted for it and he gives each kind of seed its own body. My friends, I'm very excited about this because it's talking about near-death events, isn't it? All things made of flesh are not the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds have another, and fish have yet another kind. Also, there are heavenly bodies and uh, earthly bodies, but the beauty of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the beauty of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of beauty, the moon has another kind, and the stars have another, and each star is different in its beauty. It will be the same when those who have died are raised to life. The body that is planted in the grave will ruin and destroy. Ruin and decay. I'm sorry. But it will be raised to a life that cannot be destroyed. What do you think that life is, my friends? When the body is planted, it is without honor. <laughs> but when it is raised, it is with great it will be great and glorious when the body is planted it is weak but when it is raised it will be full of power the body that is planted is a physical body when it is raised it is a spiritual body my friends this should, should have comfort in those of you that have lost loved ones and want to know what's going on with them there is a physical body so there is also a spiritual body as the scripture says the first man Adam became a living person but the last Adam is a living giving, is a life giving spirit. That's Jesus Christ. The spiritual man did not come first. It was the physical man that came first. Then came the spiritual. The first man came from the dust of the earth. The second man came from heaven. All people belong to the earth. There are, they are like the first man of earth, which is Adam. But those who belong to heaven are like the man of heaven, which is Jesus. Get this, my friends. We were made like the man on earth, so we will also be made like the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, our bodies of flesh and blood cannot have a part in, in God's kingdom. Okay, I'm going to read that again. This is important. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, our bodies of flesh and blood cannot have the part in have a part in, the, in God's kingdom. Something that will ruin cannot have a part in something that never ruins. But listen, I tell you this secret. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. Get that. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. What an amazing scripture. It will only take the time. It will only take the time of a second. We will be changed as quickly as a uh, eye blinks. This will happen when the last trumpet blows. The trumpet will blow and there and those who have died will be raised to life forever and we will all be changed. This body that ruins must clothe itself with something that will never ruin and the body that dies must clothe itself with something that will never die. So that body that ruins will clothe itself with those which never ruins. And that body that dies with clothes will clothe itself with that which never dies. 
When this happens, the scriptures will be made true. Death is swallowed in victory. And that comes out of Isaiah 25, 8. O oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your power to hurt? Hosanna 13, verse 14. Death's power to hurt is sin. Let me read that again. Death's power to hurt is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But we thank God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, stand strong. Don't let anyone change you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. You know that your work in the Lord has never wasted. What an amazing scripture that is. That gives us hope, my friends, for the afterlife. That gives us hope for those people that have died and it gives us hope to understand that when our physical body dies, it's going to go to the grave and it's going to turn to dust or it's going to be cremated and turn to smoke. And uh, our spiritual body is going to raise it up. It's going to be changed, my friends. So to answer that question again, my friends, I pleaded for God for a second chance. Has God revealed a way for me to help people? And yes, my friends, he has. I want to show you a, a picture. This picture is a map view to... Uh, Heart Heart Refinement Online School Program. My friends, we can get caught up so much into the religion of this world that we fail to have that relationship with Jesus. So my friends, I want to talk to you about my online school. You want a relationship with Jesus, my friends, it's going to have to start with understanding why people follow this man. Okay, You're going to see in uh, session one, we're going to cover a lot of things. We're going to cover repentance. We're going to cover cleansing. We're going to re we're going to cover uh, pruning. We're going to cover the need for Jesus. We're going to cover the need for a blind spot checker. We're going to cover the need to have a savior, my friends. And in uh, session two, my friends, uh, which is stage two, um, we're going to cover 10 sessions to prepare our heart to following Jesus Christ. My friends, having a relationship with Jesus Christ is not about religion. It's not about any of the denominations out there. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ to give you access to God. I have created a map view and an online school program that will help you to have a better relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how I'm helping people. I am endorsing this program and I have several pastors that have also endorsed this program. So my friends, I invite you to watch this uh, video on what the Heart to Heart Refinement School is all about. My friends, that is it. That's all the questions that I have for my near-death event. I have uh, covered a lot of stuff in this uh, video, my friends. We're at 41 minutes. So I'm going to close this out, my friends. May God bless you. May His face shine upon you. And may Jesus always bring you joy. I'll see you in the next video.